because this is what uh, really works because uh, uh, what mother nature created uh, um, cannot be replaced by any material not even uh, ceramic and not even hybrid material so uh, we need to respect my nature. well hello and welcome to the dental digest podcast this is a podcast devoted to evidence-based dentistry so that you never fall behind on this show we are very fortunate to have dr simone de la perry he is doing a webinar with the academy of biomedic dentistry on january 30th and we are going to get a sneak peek into some of what he's going to talk about all you have to do to get registered is go to the Academy of Biomedic Dentistry's website to get started. Let me tell you about Dr. Della Perry. He has authored several scientific publications on restorative and aesthetic dentistry in peer-reviewed journals since 2002. He serves on the editorial board of the Operative Dentistry Journal, the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry, and the PPAD. Dr. Della Perry is a national and international lecturer. He has been providing continuing education and hands-on courses on restorative and biomedic dentistry, both in Europe and the United States. Welcome to Dental Digest. This is a podcast devoted to following evidence-based dental literature. Here's your host, Dr. Melissa Seibert. She's a dentist currently practicing in the Air Force. With that being said, nothing contained within this podcast is intended to be reflective or endorsed by the U.S. Air Force. Why is it so necessary to implement stress-reducing protocols? It's uh, so important because uh, uh, it helps uh, uh, to avoid uh, uh, problems in the short term and in the long term. Uh, actually, it also helps to avoid a problem uh, regarding to post-op sensitivity, which is uh, one of the main uh, problems that people uh, uh, are having uh, when they are placing uh, direct composite uh, restoration, especially if these restorations are placed in IC factor uh, configuration, cavity configurations. Mm -hmm. And why would that stress lead to post-operative sensitivity? Because uh, if you do not stress uh, reduce all of your resin because of the chemistry are going uh, uh, to shrink um, uh, following the curing uh, protocol. So uh, a gap is going uh, to be created uh, uh, between uh, um, the bond if you do not have uh, uh, a good bond and uh, uh, the composite, that means uh, the tooth structure and uh, the restorative material. So these two entities are not uh, uh, going to work uh, as uh, um, just a, a tooth restoration complex, uh, but uh, we are going uh, to work as uh, two different uh, um, parts of uh, uh, a system. Uh, that's why you may have uh, the post-op sensitivity. Um, so that's the main reason. Mm -hmm. And you've dedicated an immense part of your career toward developing stress-reducing protocols. Would you tell us, give us an overview about some of those protocols? Absolutely. Um, I have started uh, uh, the stress-reducing uh, protocol uh, since uh, I was uh, a student. At Tufts University, I was uh, trying to research this area because, uh, uh, once again, the post-operative sensitivity uh, was a, a big issue 20 years ago, but uh, it is still uh, an issue um, today. Uh, and the main reason is that uh, um, material, uh, materials uh, uh, have improved a lot, uh, but uh, the chemistry um, is still uh, very similar. So we are going to have uh, uh, still a shrinkage in the composite and uh, the residual stress may be uh, transmitted either to the hybrid layer or uh, the residual to structure. Um, this stress may be responsible for uh, the formation uh, of a gap uh, between uh, the composite and uh, the tooth if uh, the bond uh, is not good enough, especially if the bond uh, 
uh, to dentin, uh, which is a little bit more challenging to uh, achieve comparing uh, to the bond uh, to dentin. If the bond is still good, uh, all of the stress is going to be transmitted to the residual cavity walls and uh, uh, different uh, side effects uh, may be developed, including uh, um, the, uh, moving, the movement of the, uh, the cusp, that means uh, cusp deflection, uh, um, uh, with uh, sometimes we may also have uh, some uh, um, crack uh, outside uh, on uh, the surface of uh, enamel because of uh, the residual strain in uh, the restoration. So uh, it's very important uh, to reduce uh, all of these uh, uh, phenomena related to stress because uh, um, micro leakage may occur, that means bacteria may penetrate uh, at the um, tooth restoration interface and uh, may be responsible for a, a secondary decay in the long term, but uh, uh, if a, a gap is created uh, right away, once the patient uh, leaves the dental chair, then uh, um, some uh, dentinal tubule may be exposed uh, and uh, tooth sensitivity, post-op uh, sensitivity uh, may occur, uh, which is uh, uh, very, very uh, bad for the patient because uh, uh, we are not uh, sealing uh, uh, the tooth restoration interface uh, and uh, uh, a big damage uh, may occur uh, to the tooth. I had uh, patients uh, coming into my office uh, uh, so many times uh, complaining about uh, post-op sensi post sensitivity in uh, direct composite restoration, even in direct composite restoration that uh, were placed a uh, um, uh, few weeks, a uh, few months, uh, or maybe uh, Year earlier. So, um, this is a, a huge discomfort for a patient who, who paid for a, a treatment uh, and was not uh, able to, to solve uh, uh, the problem, uh, uh, which was uh, the main reason, pain, uh, which was uh, the main reason for uh, uh, going uh, to the dentist. Uh, so, this is very, very important. I had a patient referring to me that. Uh, they had uh, um, their uh, teeth uh, suffering from uh, post-op sensitivity um, going uh, to um, endo, so uh, becoming uh, uh, the vital teeth uh, uh, because uh, of the issue of uh, tooth sensitivity. So this is uh, really a big, big problem uh, uh, even today. That's why uh, so many people are still uh, using amalgam because uh, um, it does not uh, have most of the time uh, this kind uh, of problem but then amalgam, uh, am amalgam restoration may create other problems uh, over the years that uh, we all know including uh, 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 cracking of both enamel and dentin which uh, may be responsible for fracture of uh, a portion of the tooth, maybe a cusp uh, or uh, maybe a complete uh, fracture of uh, a wall, uh, which may uh, be sometimes uh, uh, catastrophic uh, and uh, may be responsible for uh, the tooth extraction, which is uh, the loss of the tooth. So this is a really, really um, big issue that we need to address. That's why it's so important uh, to know all uh, uh, the ABC of the uh, stress reducing uh, protocols in order to avoid this problem. I had people that uh, came to me and uh, had this problem uh, of post -op, uh, op sensitivity with a composite and uh, really I had a, a very hard time uh, to push them to try again to place uh, a direct composite restoration. Um, so sometimes uh, um, the pain, especially on chewing, is uh, so bad for the patient that uh, 
uh, they prefer to keep uh, the old restoration and avoid uh, um, uh, the placement of uh, a direct composite restoration because of the issue of uh, tube sensitivity. And uh, all uh, is related uh, um, uh, to uh, the issue of uh, uh, stress and how the stress uh, uh, is going to create uh, uh, strain into uh, the tooth, uh, tooth restoration complex. Mm -hmm. So you touched on a very important point. What is it about amalgam that can ultimately lead to cracks and, in a worst-case scenario, catastrophic failure of the tooth? Because uh, amalgam and uh, tooth structure are not bonded together, so they do work as two different uh, um, entities uh, uh, in the tooth restoration complex. In other words, uh, uh, the amalgam uh, is working uh, um, as a filling material, uh, it's just filling uh, a cavity and uh, the way the cavity is prepped for an amalgam uh, um, is creating uh, the foundation for future problems that means uh, um, cracks into restoration. Uh, for many years, uh, um, and uh, this is still happening, uh, uh, and I'm trying to change uh, uh, this trend, actually, uh, all the dentists in the world uh, are thinking of the material. So is ma the material strong enough uh, in order to uh, do a restoration, to do maybe a crown, uh, if the, um, uh, the tooth is structurally compromised? The problem is not uh, uh, thinking of the material first. Okay, it's important, of course, but it's not uh, the first priority. The first priority is to consider the tooth, the tooth structure. So this is what uh, makes uh, the restoration really work. So when we prep uh, a tooth for an amalgam restoration, we are thinking to make uh, the um, material, the amalgam, working by destroying the tooth. And this is the same that is happening uh, when we um, prep uh, for a crown. We are trying uh, to uh, create, uh, create a retention form using a strong material in order to uh, make the restoration strong. But then uh, the tooth is uh, suffering from the different modulus of elasticity between uh, the rigid restoration and uh, um, and the tooth structure, which uh, uh, and this uh, mismatch uh, in the modulus of elasticity is going uh, to create uh, some micro movement uh, uh, in the restoration uh, at the tooth restoration interface that is going uh, to create leakage. That means uh, um, bacteria uh, into the tooth structure, uh, which may create uh, a lot of problems, of course. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's time. Uh, uh, to think in a different way, and this is uh, something uh, that uh, uh, is uh, typical of the stress reducing uh, uh, composite protocol. It's not just a stress, in, uh, um, stress reducing a restoration, but it's a different way of thinking. You need to think uh, to the tooth first. So the tooth is the first priority, and uh, the material is uh, just uh, a mean to replace in a compliant way what uh, has been lost uh, due to disease uh, carries uh, um, due to endodontic treatment or maybe due to uh, trauma or uh, maybe um, uh, secondary carries because of uh, uh, a failing uh, restoration. Could be composite amalgam or uh, ceramic doesn't matter. So the main uh, point uh, for uh, the clinician, clinicians is not just selecting the material, but uh, look at the tooth all the time. This is uh, uh, mandatory to me. So when I place my composite restoration, stress reduced composite restoration, my first priority um, is to save as much tooth structure as possible. 
because this is what uh, really works because uh, uh, what mother nature created uh, um, cannot be replaced by any material not even uh, ceramic and not even hybrid material so uh, we need to respect my, the nature and uh, over the years uh, i learned uh, uh, that uh, um, even in the most structurally compromised uh, tooth, uh, it's uh, so important uh, to preserve the weak, thin uh, walls. This is what uh, uh, makes uh, the restoration uh, work uh, in a reliable way in the long term. The only problem is that we are missing uh, protocols uh, that are able uh, to protect uh, these uh, thin walls. And uh, here I am. I'm trying so to tell us, Yeah. Tell us about the protocols that you have developed. Well, uh, first of all, uh, once again, uh, we needed to be non-invasive. Uh, I used to say uh, we have to be minimally invasive. Uh, now I'm changing... Uh, uh, I'm switching from minimally invasive to uh, non-invasive. So, in other words, uh, I, love, I do love the additive, additive uh, restorations, both in the anterior and uh, posterior areas, because uh, um, we are uh, saving 100% of the um, residual tooth structure, even in the most structurally compromised uh, uh, clinical scenario. Once uh, you decide to, uh, to save this uh, remains on to structure, now you need to be able to preserve and uh, to protect, uh, to reinforce uh, this uh, residual to structure and protect it from the stress coming from both uh, the restorative material, for example, the composite, uh, and uh, the occlusion, that means the function. So we need to think uh, uh, in the long term. So when we design a composite, a stress-reducing composite restoration, we are just not doing a regular filling. Okay? Uh, our goal is not to bulk fill uh, uh, the restoration, just to make sure that uh, we do not uh, have uh, a cavity anymore. So it's not like in the old days that you drill and fill and the, the patient go back uh, home. It's, uh, it's different. We need to spend more time uh, in the attempt to, um, to treat uh, the tooth in the right way. Okay, so I'm not calling it a filling, I'm calling it a restoration. Restoration means something that takes some more time, that you develop brick by brick. Each brick is uh, uh, 1 to 1.5 millimeter uh, wedge shape increment of a composite uh, that you place uh, in uh, to the cavity in order uh, to um, uh, reduce the stress uh, coming from uh, polymerization shrink. So by using uh, this layering uh, technique, uh, uh, layer after layer, uh, increment after increment, uh, it's also known uh, as a deli beats in uh, uh, our community. Um, the deli beats application allows you to reduce stress. And you, if you couple uh, um, the layering protocol with uh, a pulse curing uh, technique, you are allowing the material, the composite material, to delay the gel point. Okay, in other words, you are able to uh, give some more time for the composite uh, for stress, for stress uh, relief. And it is uh, very important because uh, you are uh, allowing uh, to reduce stress, uh, but you are also allowing uh, to give more time for uh, the composite molecules to create uh, more uh, interpre uh, interpenetrating and cross-linking uh, chain, uh, chains uh, in the polymer that are also uh, that will also improve uh, the uh, mechanical properties of the material. So uh, this is uh, just a brief review of the 
stress reducing uh, protocol re regarding uh, the composite material. Okay. Um, but then we needed to think of uh, uh, the function. So you need to create design of restoration in a way that uh, uh, it's able uh, to withstand uh, the stress uh, coming uh, um, following, uh, you know, function. So this is also so very, very important. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Adele a bit. Would you please explain to us the how to actually place that and the technique involved? Uh, you need to see me. <laughs> Oh, you need to see a video. Yes, uh, the idea uh, is to place these small increments uh, in order to be bonded to, it's a triangular shaped increment that is bonded to only two bonded surfaces. For example, in a class one or class two restoration. So as you are bonding to only two bonded surfaces, by placing these deli bits, you are uh, uh, creating with your layering uh, protocol um, a cavity configuration for uh, each increment that is similar to that of a class four restoration, where the ratio of bonded to unbonded surface, surfaces uh, is uh, very favorable. Okay, uh, so the stress uh, is automatically reduced. Then it's very important, uh, so you pass through each increment and you do not try to connect uh, the opposing uh, cavity walls uh, right away with a single increment. This is true for both the proximal enamel replacement, which is the first step in uh, a class two uh, direct composite restoration, we build up the proximal surfaces, but it's also uh, true for the dentine replacement, okay? because we build up, according to this stress-reducing protocol, the proximal surface first. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we are giving a time for uh, the bond to dentin to mature. Because uh, bonding to dentin takes some more time than bonding to enamel. So I usually uh, build up the proximal surface first with multiple deli beads. And then I place a, a very thin layer of flowable composite just on the floor. Okay, and this is a recommendation um, and accurate. And this is a recommendation that is coming from my first paper uh, where I did introduce for the first time this protocol back in 2002, publishing the ADA. And it's also true for uh, the um, occlusal enamel build-up. That means uh, we are trying to build up each cusp separately without connecting each other in order to um, uh, uh, avoid the cusp deflection. You remember the, this was one of the problems uh, related to post-op sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And this way you are also protecting the hybrid layer from stress. So that's very, very important. So you give time for the um, hybrid layer to mature in order to um, be stronger. And uh, you try to stress reduce this, uh, this area uh, in order uh, to uh, avoid the formation of a gap at the interface. Mm -hmm. You've brought up a very important point. And so the commonly held belief in dentistry is that the bond to enamel is always stronger than the bond to dentin. But Dr. Della Perry, with all of your background, would you please correct that statement and explain why the bond to dentin is stronger? It's stronger if, uh, uh, if, you, are, uh, if you give time uh, for uh, uh, the bond to dentin to mature. If you bond uh, uh, to dentin immediately, in a high C factor configuration, then uh, it's true that uh, uh, the bond uh, to dentin uh, is weaker. But uh, we learned that we do not have to do that. Um, we need to give time for this uh, uh, bond to mature. Uh, and uh, we cannot rush. 
That's why uh, we cannot uh, just place uh, uh, a regular filling, okay? Or we cannot bulk fill uh, a restoration because uh, we are not giving uh, time uh, for this bond to, to mature beyond all uh, the other problems. And uh, please also remember that the more structurally compromised the tooth, uh, the more difficult will be for the dentist uh, to create uh, a long-lasting uh, um, restoration of being conservative. Uh, so this is very, very important. If you want to be uh, conservative, you want to um, uh, perform almost additive uh, restorations, uh, you need to, to ma really master the stress-reducing uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's not uh, uh, easy to do that, so it requires a learning curve that uh, then will bring you uh, to do more and more uh, complex uh, restorations. It took uh, almost 20 years for me to achieve uh, um, this le level of dentistry, but now we are able to teach it right away. Um, so uh, people can learn this protocol, um, take back home and uh, uh, start the learning curve that uh, will uh, last uh, not 20 years, as uh, it happened to me, <laughs> uh, by developing the protocol, but it will uh, uh, take uh, uh, less time. Uh, training is uh, very, very important uh, if you want to perform uh, uh, stress reducing uh, restoration uh, and 100% uh, preservation of the residual tooth growth. Going back to your questions regarding the dentin and enamel bond, if you bond to enamel immediately, uh, at time zero, uh, of course, the bond to enamel is, uh, is uh, stronger. That's why we start building up the proximal surface first, um, which is just a replacement of the missing enamel. So it's going to be a very thin layer of uh, composite uh, up to uh, 0.5 in the cervical, uh, up to one, 1 1.5 into the occlusal. Um, which is completed uh, doing, uh, depending on the size uh, of the defect uh, of the restoration uh, with different delegates. Mm -hmm. And so you've also developed a curing protocol. What is it? Yeah, the curing protocol, uh, um, actually I didn't devol develop it. I just reviewed the literature and uh, I tried uh, to uh, take uh, the information that were coming uh, from the literature. And uh, there was uh, evidence that uh, uh, delaying uh, the gel point, uh, that means uh, giving time to the composite to move uh, into the degradation of the cavity walls uh, is very important. Once the gel point, uh, this is happening in the pre-gel phase, okay? So when you start the polymerization process. Once the gel point is achieved, that means uh, the molecules uh, are locked and they, they cannot move anymore. All the, stress, also all the residual stress uh, is uh, concentrated into the composite and transmitted into the cavity walls uh, uh, via the hybrid layer in the tank. So by delaying the gel point, uh, uh, that means uh, pulse curing uh, for one second, two seconds, depending on uh, the location of the increment we are uh, placing. We are just delaying the gel point. We are giving more time to the composite to move, and by moving, releasing stress. And at the same time, you are giving more time for connecting, for the polymer to connect, to cross-link, uh, uh, to interpenetrating uh, the different chains. And this is uh, very he helpful in uh, improving the I mean, mechanical properties uh, of uh, the composite. And uh, we have uh, studies from both uh, uh, Japan, Europe, uh, and uh, um, 
the US uh, uh, demonstrating uh, that the stress uh, is going to interfere with the mechanical properties of the composite. Mm. And so I've also had some input from colleagues in the biomimetic community who recommended that I ask you about your opinion of EverX. Do you have a special stance on it or any commentary? I believe it's a very promising uh, material. Um, and uh, we are missing uh, clinical trials. So we don't have uh, long-term clinical trials uh, on the, the material. I know that uh, the community uh, is very, very uh, focused on this material and it's very, uh, it has a very interesting uh, um, chemistry. Uh, but we do not uh, know enough, including both for the Everex and the Everex flow. And we do not uh, know enough regarding uh, the long-term result of the material. But uh, I'm coming back to the same question that uh, I asked you and all the people that are listening uh, to us. It's more important uh, uh, to have uh, um, a strong material because uh, this material Everex has uh, an uh, increased uh, fracture and toughness. Okay, so this material is uh, stronger comparing to regular uh, composite. Uh, the fracture and toughness is defined as the ability of a material um, uh, to resist the crack propagation. So, um, for this reason, the material uh, is pretty interesting. Um, we have some contradiction in the literature. Uh, if uh, uh, and I'm uh, referring to in vitro studies only. I'm not talking about clinical because uh, since I know we do not have any clinical study on uh, uh, this uh, material in the long term. I mean, um, we have a contradiction uh, even in the literature regarding the in vitro study. If this material should be applied in layers uh, or uh, maybe bulk fill, as the company uh, is recommending. And uh, uh, from the literature um, and from uh, uh, still resin, so it's going to shrink anyway, this material. So it, it has uh, an increase of fractional toughness, but uh, it's not uh, going to be a miracle material. Okay, so probably uh, I'm a little bit worried that the uh, dentists are uh, expecting too much uh, from this material. This material probably is going to work pretty well if you uh, make it work well as all the material, uh, restorative material. That means if you work uh, uh, with the material in layers. Okay, so I would recommend to use a delicate. And uh, once again, uh, you think to the tooth first. So if the, um, if the cavity is not big enough, uh, any material, almost any material in the short term uh, is going to work uh, pretty well. You, you may not see if you use a good bonding agent, uh, gold standard bonding agent, uh, um, so different result in the clinical uh, uh, scenario. Um, if the shielding effect of the tooth uh, is enough, in other words, the tooth is able to protect uh, the uh, from the drawbacks coming from the materials. The problem is when uh, the cavity is becoming. Uh, bigger and bigger, and uh, the cavity walls uh, are uh, becoming thinner and thinner. So the shielding effect uh, of the tooth uh, is dramatically reduced. So it's uh, now the time uh, for us to uh, create the condition um, for uh, uh, that residual tooth structure to keep working by reinforcing it and protecting it from stress coming from both uh, um, the uh, material, could be even Everex, um, 
and the function that means the occlusion in the long term. This is key. So I believe the material is going to work pretty well if we use it uh, uh, in layers, uh, in daily bits, and uh, if the shielding effect of the tooth uh, is good enough. If we are going to have uh, very cavity thin walls, where, uh, then we need to use uh, maybe a continuous fiber, um, like the wallpaper in protocol that uh, we did develop, instead of uh, uh, a chopped fiber, or maybe a combination of continuous uh, fibers close to the, uh, very close to the residual cavity thin wall, uh, thin cavity walls, and then the Everex uh, as uh, a dentin replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be a, a good combination of the material. This is uh, uh, the way I would recommend to use it, as far as you use it in thin layers. And so now you have an upcoming webinar with the Academy of Biomimetic Dentistry, and there is a lot of hype about it in our community. Would you give us an overview about what you're going to talk about? Because we had the honor of getting a brief sneak peek into your expertise in this interview, but you're going to go way more in depth in your webinar. Yeah, we'll try to give a more detailed introduction to the stress reducing the red composite protocol um, for restoration. Um, medium to large size uh, restoration, including uh, the direct uh, cast replacement. This, uh, uh, everything is uh, just the original stress reduced direct composite protocol published in, in 2002 and uh, uh, implemented by a step by step uh, protocol uh, that, that uh, includes uh, six main steps. And uh, we are going uh, to go through all of these steps um, and uh, people will have a chance uh, to be uh, introduced uh, to this protocol in order for them uh, to be maybe more curious about that uh, and uh, investigate uh, more about that uh, and uh, maybe learn even more about uh, um, the more structurally compromised uh, teeth. So I'm, uh, the plan is uh, for me to give uh, a lecture on stress reduced direct composite restoration only. And uh, then uh, uh, David Oleman and I are going to complete a duo uh, webinar for the ABD, uh, where we are going to review our 2017 paper. Uh, uh, published in uh, the Operative Dentistry Journal about uh, the wallpapering. So we are dealing uh, with this, this second webinar uh, with more structurally compromised teeth. But the foundation of everything is the stress-reduced direct composite protocol. You cannot skip uh, the stress-reduced direct composite protocol if you want to use uh, the wallpapering in the right way. And if a clinician were to fail to implement these protocols, what are some of the shortcomings? What might they find? We've talked about post-operative sensitivity. What are some of the other shortcomings? Shortcomings um, could be fracture of the restoration, a fracture of the uh, tooth restoration complex, uh, or maybe a catastrophic uh, failure of uh, the tooth. That means mm. uh, a fracture that is going... Uh, um, uh, to go below uh, the gingival level into the uh, cement or into the root, so that uh, uh, unfortunately sometimes the tooth uh, may uh, may require some uh, more invasive therapy or uh, maybe the extraction, which we want uh, to avoid. We want to stop the cycle of death. Uh, for the tooth. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Do you have any closing remarks to leave us with? Yeah, I would uh, encourage uh, all the people to follow us, um, uh, to follow me maybe on Instagram. Uh, please be aware that I'm also giving uh, um, a three-day 
a three-day course uh, on uh, stress reducing the red composite uh, protocol uh, from A to Z, where you can uh, uh, really implement, uh, uh, un really understand, first of all, this philosophy of uh, um, uh, tooth preservation uh, first, followed by uh, stress reducing from uh, both the composite and uh, um, and the function. So um, we, usu we usually like to say to get bonded and to stay bonded. This is something coming from uh, uh, my buddy uh, David Oleman, and I would like to add to this sense sentence uh, via stress reducing protocols, which is uh, the key to achieve long term uh, success. On the other hand, I'm also going uh, to uh, launch soon uh, a three-day webinar on uh, uh, additive direct uh, composite restoration in the anterior area. So this is another topic uh, that uh, I'm going to cover pretty soon. So for uh, all of those who are interested, uh, not only in uh, anterior, uh, in uh, posterior restoration, but also anterior uh, restoration with uh, 100% uh, of a tooth uh, preservation, even when you get uh, tooth discoloration, these are the way uh, to go. So just follow me. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time and for your patience to, to uh, listen to me and uh, for your question and for your time as well. I really appreciate it.